All right, so thank you so much for sharing your, a little bit about your own personal experience and background with us. Um, and you talked uh, about your experience in coming to Glendale, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about um, kind of some of the, um, your viewpoint on some of the anti-Armenian sentiment that happens, um, that still happens in Glendale, even though it is still, it is one of the largest communities of Armenian folks. And so I wanted to get your perspective on that. And then also I wanted you to share with us, um, um, because I know you also personally ex experienced some of that um, when you were running for the 43rd district assembly seat. I uh, wanna know how that has shaped your leadership today. So, you know, Gl Glendale has a unique history um, first of all, it's a great place to live. And the vast majority of people who live in Glendale are really, really good people who um, are, are, are not racists, they're not bigots. Um, but, you know, Glendale also has a history, I think, that echoes through the years um, all the way to present day. It was the headquarters of the American wing of the American Nazi Party. Um, it was a place where at various times there were you know, uh, laws and, and rules in place to prevent um, African Americans and other people of color from, from living. Um, and, you know, certainly I, di I didn't necessarily grow up with that. Um, and Armenians are in somewhat more of a unique situation because when there weren't that many Armenians still in Glendale, it's not like there was explicit discrimination against Armenians, but um, it, it certainly isn't necessarily always easy, but it's not also an apples to apples comparison between someone who's black and um, someone who's white. But I'll, I'll give you an in interesting story, an anecdote that happened. This was maybe 17 years ago. There was the Armenian, you know, now we have this week of remembrance and um, for the Armenian genocide. Well, the impetus of that was because there was a council member, then mayor, Gus Gomez, who wanted to lower the flag to half staff in front of City Hall in commemoration of the genocide. Now, this was something that had been done by other council members um, and, you know, white council members, uh, so to speak, until he decided to do it. And then all of a sudden, it was the worst thing that had ever happened. It was so disrespectful of the American flag. They actually launched a recall against this council member. The council chambers would be filled with 500, 600 people, overflow crowds, claiming that the city was being disrespectful of the US flag code. And um, the city decided at that time, well, what can we do in lieu of lowering the flag to commemorate the genocide um, and also not upset the people who thought this was insulting um, to uh, the American uh, government and American, uh, the American flag code. And that's when this week of remembrance issue came about. So I was on the committee at the time. I was appointed by then council member uh, Manukian. I was just in my early 20s. I was still in college. And there was this event at the Civic Auditorium uh, in Glendale, right across from Glendale College. And, you know, as the event was happening, I hung out with the TV crews from some of the news stations because the issue had gotten some attention, a lot of attention in the local news. And while the event was happening inside, um, I hung out by the news van with some of the guys who were with the crew as they were having um, a break and uh, one of them was having a cigarette and and he turned to his friend and he said you know Glendale has I grew up in Glendale but man Glendale has changed a lot and so I asked him out of curiosity I said well where do you live now and where he mentioned he lived was not very far from Glendale and I said I'm just curious like you know you you haven't been to Glendale for a long time like you know you don't come to the Galleria you don't come to you know, the American, you know, why have you not been to Glendale recently if you live so close? Because in my mind, there's so much to do in Glendale. And he said, you know, um, my family is Latino. And, you know, when my parents bought a house in the south part of the city, which is known some, uh, by some as Tropico, he goes, my dad had to go to every single house and get a signature from the neighbor saying that was okay for a Latino family to move into that neighborhood. And he said, I promised myself that when I grew up, I was gonna leave Glendale and never come back. It was a very difficult place for me to live in. And that really left a very, you know, lasting mark on me that, you know, that kind of an experience can really paint a person's perspective of a whole city and a community. And I try to explain to him, you know, I went into my, you know, shameless Glendale promotion about how Glendale has, is such a great place. It's so diverse and there's so many different cultures and communities that live there. But, 
you know, let's remember that that's not, that wasn't that long ago. You know, when we talk about the case of Loving versus Virginia, in, which is a Supreme Court case that basically criminalized, you know, it was, it was a crime in Virginia to marry someone of a different race. And, you know, the authorities went into the home of the Loving couple, um, their last name was Loving, and, you know, arrested them for having gotten married, I believe, in Washington, D.C., and then having come back to Virginia. This was like in the late 1960s that happened, you know. Um, and so Glendale still has those vestiges of that past that sometimes, you know, emerge now, but I don't think it's reflective of the entire community. In terms of me personally, yes, like on my campaigns, you know, I've had people um, threaten my life, threaten the life of my volunteers. One person on this last campaign for city council alluding to the Armenian genocide, actually coming out and directly saying it, saying that it did not go far enough because there's still Armenians today and that they would never vote for anyone who was Armenian. Um, you know, I can take that and internalize it and allow it to create anger, um, or I can try to love everyone and, you know, serve everyone. I, you know, as a council member, I take an oath of office to serve the citizens of the city, just as I did as city clerk, regardless of whether they like me or not. Um, you know, the words of Jackie Robinson, one of my personal heroes, is that, you know, I don't care if you like me, I just expect you to respect me. And, and I think the same, you know, it goes for any one of us. Great. Thank you so much, um, Artie, for sharing that and your experience and, um, and being able to move forward with your leadership despite that and, and come from a place of love and compassion. I think that's very honorable. So thank you. You mentioned a, um, a little bit and touched a little bit on Glendale's um, his, um, past and its racial history. And um, one of the things I found interesting coming, being new to Glendale and coming to Glendale is learning more and more about um, its exclusionary past around and mainly around African Americans and people of color with as a sundown town. And even um, so, we don't hear a lot about the talk about that in Glendale. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of it as um, when I came to work at this organization and as I'm looking to move and I started doing research for this interview, I started thinking, moving to Glendale, I'm kind of thinking of like, where places are, where places should I actually really move given that I'm an African-American woman and I have an adult African-American son based on some of the things that I've read. Um, so I want to uh, explore that a little bit and it just seems like there's been very little attention given to Glendale's racist history. Um, and um, and it, mainly around it being a sundown town. So can you tell me a little bit, do you think this type of silence helps or hinders our community? And you know, what legacy, legacy is still with us because of the, the, that's, that um, exclusionary um, rule that was in place? Well, first of all, that I, I abhor those covenants that um, ban the transfer of property or um, discourage the transfer of property to individuals of color or of ethnicities that are not, you know, the generally, you know, some people I've heard say, well, that's what it was like back then. Those are California laws. Well, you know, to hell with that. We have now an opportunity to make the past right and we should. Um, you know, in terms of its legacy, I think the legacy is a very troubled one and I and I am one who wants to see us address these issues head on as best we can. Um, it's for to you first of all I would say move wherever you want to move <laughs> and and live however you want to live and I say that not because of any wisdom that I've gained in my life. Um, you know I mentioned early on like I'm you know I'm a white male but because of, I think that, you know, to allow certain things to change our behavior um, allows the people that want to divide us as Americans, as individuals, as human beings and dehumanize us, it helps them win. And, and this is something, a realization I came to from Dr. Terrence Roberts, who is, who lives in Pasadena, um, an amazingly intelligent, profound um, person, a doctor of psychology. He is he was one of the little, he's a living civil rights icon. He was one of the Little Rock Nine, who after Brown versus Board of Education went to desegregate um, Little Rock High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. 
And you've all seen pictures of him because you've seen the pictures in your history books of US armed soldiers, National Guardsmen, escorting these students to that high school. These were students who had to go to high school for a year escorted by US military personnel. Only up to the doors of the classrooms and what happened in those classrooms and what happened into the gyms and the locker rooms, um, you know, it's very hard to think what high what these wonderful high school students had to endure as, I mean, as a parent, it just breaks you up. <clears throat> and, you know, I invited him to Glendale College last year um, to speak to my uh, political science class as we were learning about the civil rights movement. And, um, you know, someone asked him, one of my students asked him, it was actually a, one of the DACA, it was a DACA recipient and student who said, you know, how, do you, how did you love a country that didn't love you back? And, you know, it really, I mean, first of all, that really broke me up. But his answer was also as surprising and profound and impactful when he said, you can't let anyone define who you are. Only you can define yourself. He goes, I knew I wanted an education and I was not going to let anything stand in its way. And he probably had more bad days than good days. But ultimately, what the Little Rock Nine did, what Brown versus Board of Education did, what you know, everyone who marched in Washington did, has helped make us into the society that we are today. And we're all better for it. So um, the trouble and the challenge with civil rights movements, regardless of who initiates them or how, who's fighting for it, for whose rights, is that the change is not immediate. Remember that Brown versus Board of Education was a Supreme Court decision rendered in 1954. It wasn't until 1964, 10 years later, that we would have to have the Civil Rights Act passed by Congress and signed by Lyndon Johnson. And that is 100 years after the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, which should have, should have settled the debate about racism and institutionalized racism and slavery and all of the trauma and human rights violations that were committed against Americans of African descent in this country. Um, so, you know, the question is, you know, where are we now? What can be done? The work is ongoing. It never stops. Um, and it's just going to take all of us and it's going to take awareness and it's going to take one thing that I hope to see is understanding, understanding on all sides. Um, I try, as, as I might, and people may disagree with this approach, but to understand where is the hate coming from? What is it that is causing it? You know, to just label it as evil is not enough. And, and you know, I find this, this comes to me from the words of Martin Luther King, who wrote a great speech in, from, from a jail cell. I think it was in Albany. Um, he wrote this almost sermon-like letter where he said, you know, when we realize that there is evil in the best of us and there's good in the worst of us on both sides and that we somehow have to figure out how to get along with the people that are attacking us now, that is when we become better people as a whole. You know, his, his you know, Martin Luther King's roots in, in his faith, I think, were probably one of the most um, important aspects of his, his struggle um, and how he led um, America through the civil rights movement. Can you come, Diego? Did you finish it? Sorry. That's okay. I may have a little visitor, but please, I'm listening. <laughs> so um, given, you know, Glendale's history around being a sundown town, and, uh, and, and now that we see Glendale becoming more and more diverse with, with new communities and different communities. Um, and I, when I was doing my research, I found out there was only, there's been many sundown towns, but there's been only one city that has actually um, passed a resolution to publicly recognize and acknowledge the, the, um, that their racial exclusionary past as a sundown town. Um, is that, if that was something that was brought um, to the city council, how would you feel about that? And is that I, mean, I think it's absolutely necessary. What I'd like to do is see all of our covenants um, eradicated and have those mentions of um, anything yeah, that's racial. That 
uh, sorry, removed. I, I apologize. I know this is not how your no, uh, audience so expects it. The, the new normal. <laughs> okay, here, hold on. Let me just bring it up. Going on. Which, which one do you want to tell me in my ear? Okay. Well, how about this? Is this something you want? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that that's something that every city, everyone should. Um, but what we, we should realize is that you can't legislate away um, the sentiments that created the problem. Like just passing it sends a message as to where we stand or what we're aspiring to. But these are all aspirational. We can't just say, okay, we did this. Glendale's fine now or any city's fine. Because then that just you know, sweeps those underlying issues under the rug. You know, Glendale may not have any um, prisons here, but, you know, the fact that we have an incarceration rate or, uh, um, you know, a criminal justice system, which sometimes is oxymoronic, that overwhelmingly or disproportionately impacts minorities and, and communities of color is something we should all be aware of. And, and, and figure out what can we do to help in that regard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot we can do. I think we need to be, we need to own up to our past. We need to face it. Um, I think it makes us a better community and um, we need to figure out ways where we can make sure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated again or the trauma isn't inflicted on you generation of people, regardless of who they are. Great, thank you. So I want to talk a little bit. I want to get in more into kind of where do we go from um, from from here and and where or where we can go. Um, but before um, I ask you some questions regarding uh, the role of the city council and what are some of your visions of, of things that you think you can do to help um, improve race relations in, um, in the city of Glendale and and end discrimination and. Uh, not just of people of color, but any new communities that are living in Glendale, whether that's LGBTQ communities um, and other people of different religious backgrounds. Um, if you were just to vision um, what this community would look like, if, if none of this existed, what would, we, what would it look like to you? What would, what would be some of the things we would see in this community? Um, how would it feel if, if, all of, if none of this ever existed? Your vision. <laughs> so, um, you know, my, my, my vision is very utopian. I mean, it is very much like, you know, the speech um, by Martin Luther King. You know, I, I hope for a society where, you know, everyone's judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin or the ending of their last name or whatever it may be. But, you know, um, it's, it's not going to be an easy road to get there. Um, it's ongoing. Again, it's a journey, not a destination. Because at various times, someone else is going to be the target of whatever ire and um, hatred or fear um, society has. I mean, I look at just within the Democratic Party, which claims to be the progressive bastion of how people have now used the term Russian infiltration of elections um, almost like it's an epithet. And I wonder if I'm a young Russian American child or a child of Russian roots and I hear these statements being made about, you know, my culture that I have nothing to do with, you know, it could be that it's the Kremlin and the regime in Russia right now. Um, and, and conversely, what's being said about the uh, coronavirus by the Republicans in with the White House right now. Right, so it cuts both ways. Um, it's it's about awareness and learning and figuring out how we can change and choose language that's um, that doesn't put people in a box. Um, and and it's ongoing. You know, I, I want to go back to a few things. You know, you asked about my experiences and awareness. I mean, you know, and and what's happening in. Glen I went to UCLA. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm a diehard Bruin. I'm very proud of that. And one of the, the greatest UCLA Bruins of all, all right, Wolverines, hey, public school, how about that? Go public universities. I know Michigan's a public university. It's uh, right up there with UCLA. Richard's showing off his Wolverine, his blue and maize pride. <laughs> um, but 
you know, UCLA, where, you know, our most, one of our most famous alumni is Jackie Robinson. And I was very proud of that fact, you know, a um, uh, person to break the color barrier. Uh, and, you know, when I found out growing up, that he had gone to John Muir High School and went to Pasadena City College. I was like, here is a, an American icon who grew up right next to Glendale. He must have played Little League or ball here in Glendale. I know Muir plays Glendale High School. They did when I was there. I couldn't find any evidence of him ever having, like, there's a plaque that says, you know, Jackie Robinson sat on this bench at, you know, um, uh, Moisey Field or uh, at Stengel Field in Glendale. And that's how I actually came to this awareness of the sunset laws that you were referring to, is that I couldn't find any, here we have one of the greatest sports icons in American history, broke the color barrier in our national pastime, and we have no evidence of him having ever been in Glendale. In fact, you know, as I dug deeper, I found out that most black people, most African Americans avoided Glendale at that time, and some still do. And I was appalled by it, right? Because I mean, you know, heck, we'll put a plaque on anything, you know, this person, uh, name a transportation center, whatever it may be. And, you know, there was nothing about Jackie Robinson. Um, and, you know, that led me on a journey to like read more about, you know, the, the black experience. And, um, you know, I came across some of the works of a, a guy by the name of Charles Gary. There's a great book called Street Fighter in the Courtroom. It's about Charles Gary, who was the preeminent civil rights attorney in California during the 60s and 70s. He was also the attorney for the Black Panther Party. He was the defense, he was the attorney um, of choice of Bobby Seale and Huey Newton, who were the founders of the Black Panther Party. Um, what people don't know about Charles Gary is that he was born Garabed Garabedian in Fresno, California. He was an Armenian whose parents Grandparents had fled the Turkish massacres of the 1890s, not the ones of 1915, uh, of the Armenian people had come and settled in Fresno. And they made a couple of really good documentaries about him because he was also the attorney for the Chicago Seven, the young individuals, including Tom Hayden, the late Tom Hayden, um, who protested the Democratic Convention um, because of the party's position on the Vietnam War. Um, and, you know, Charles Gary when he was, inter they interviewed Bobby Seale and Huey Newton and they interviewed Charles Gary about that experience of representing the, the um, Black Panthers. And they describe in it, the, the, the Bobby Seale says uh, that, um, you know, hey, we got a lot of grief for having a white attorney by, from a lot of black organizations, uh, including the NAACP and others that were saying, hey, you, you guys are the Black Panther Party, you should have a black attorney representing you in this case. They said, we just wanted the best attorney and we knew Charles Gary really understood our cause and our struggle. So they asked, um, in, the, in the documentary, they asked Charles Gary about, you know, why he did it. And he said, you know, I grew up in Fresno and Armenians were considered the N-words of the San Joaquin Valley. We got into fights all the time um, with kids who would pick on us, you know, our parents weren't allowed to buy certain properties. They couldn't move into certain neighborhoods because of who they were. He goes, but the difference is like, I changed my name and I went to law school and I was able to, you know, basically simulate into just society, no problem. Whereas a black person or a Hispanic person can't necessarily do that all. They can't, they just can't. The skin color doesn't change as easily as a person's name. And he said, you know, it is for that reason that I did that. And another thing, though, that he says that has always lasted with me is, he says, we have to just acknowledge that we're all racist. There, there's this bias um, in all of us. And we can all at various times succumb to our own, you know, whatever dark demons we may have within us. Um, I don't want to get into the suffering Olympics, because certainly, I mean, what, African Americans have endured in this country, what Native Americans have endured, um, what other communities of color have is far, far greater. But I think it, it, it warrants us to all realize that regardless, even when we are, we think we're being the best that we are trying to be that there's still some biases. Um, but I do, it, it so does. Tell me a Go little ahead. bit about, because I know we only got about 15 more minutes here and we have some questions, but I, I want to kind of, um, 
go into kind of what you think the role is of city council and around addressing the, the its racist past, around addressing racial tensions, um, discrimination that happens in the city of Glendale. That just doesn't seem like there's been much. I know there was a resolution passed a few, year, a few years ago about discrimination, but it doesn't seem like it's a conversation that's happening at the city council level. So tell me what are your thoughts around that and what do you think the role of city council should be and how we could kind of bring people together um, in, a, in a different way? I'm glad you cut me off, Tara, because I could have gone on more about <laughs> history. But you know, I think that one thing that we can do is have a human rights or human relations co um, committee commission. And I think what the human relations commission should do is study um, issues of equity and um, uh, you know, inclusion in various uh, sectors of, of our own government. You know, we have had some strides made in making our service agencies, our, our first responders, our public safety um, jobs more inclusive, but there's a lot more that we could do. Um, you know, when we look at what happened in Ferguson, in Missouri, one of the reasons I believe that that crisis and that disaster happened um, within that community uh, was because the police force does not look like the community it's policing. Um, it is a predominantly white police force policing a community that's predominantly African American. And so if I, if I was in that city, for instance, I would make sure that we have to hire more uh, black police officers more female police officers. It just has, that, so a human uh, relations co co commission would, would be studying every department, seeing how many women we have in positions of leadership. What we're doing, um, oftentimes we look at the end result, but we don't look at, you know, the journey to get people there. You know, how are we doing in terms of our hiring now to internally prepare people for that? Um, you know, in the past, Glendale used to have um, a festival it was a cultural festival. It had some hokey name. It was very cheesy, but um, it went away because of, of course, budget reasons. Um, there could be opportunities to revive that. I know that there is a pride event that unfortunately is being planned virtually this year instead of an actual event. I myself, um, when I was city clerk, helped start the Dia de los Muertos Day celebration, which has been the largest Latino um, cultural celebration in Glendale since the days of Verdugo parade went away. Um, and we just have to create, I think what government can do is ultimately create sandboxes and opportunities. If, if government tries to find the solution, it won't often get there. What it needs to do is empower nonprofits, community-based organizations and individuals who have the ideas. Like when it came to the Dia de los Muertos uh, event, I don't know how many people here have attended it. If you have, raise your hand. I can't see anyone anyways, but maybe in the chat box. But last year, we had like almost 1,500 people there. The first time we did it, the way we came up with it was the following. The city of Glendale has always wanted to get more Latinos involved in politics and in governance and, and decision-making processes. Yet, you know, the government itself, um, myself included, had done up until then a very uh, piss-poor job of it. We were awful. Because, you know, government has a very bureaucratic um, mindset when it tries to solve these issues. When one individual ran for community college board, Victor Garcia, this young uh, Latino gentleman, he, he, you know, when we do signature verification, usually you reject about 30% of the signatures on a person's nomination papers to qualify for the ballot for various reasons. The address is wrong. The name is spelled wrong. The signature doesn't match uh, what's on file at the county registrar. So, you know, between 25 to 30% of signatures get thrown out. That's why when someone was running for office and I, when I was still city clerk, I would tell people, collect more signatures than you need because about a third of them will get thrown out and you don't want to take that chance. Well, Victor Garcia comes back with his nomination papers and he has only a 10% rejection rate on his sheets and they're all Latino surnames. And, you know, I thought to myself, you know, here we are trying to figure out how to do outreach to the Latino community. This kid knows where the, I don't call him, he's not a kid, by the way. This gentleman knows where the Latino community is. He's gone to these apartments. I can see it on this roster. So I called him in and I said, hey, I want to sit down and talk to you. Me and my staff, Leo Zalian, and I brought him in and we said, look, you have done a great job. You obviously know where the community's at. What are we not doing to reach out to this community and feel them make them feel like they have ownership over what happens in the city. 
And he said, you know, most Latinos don't feel very comfortable speaking out. They, they don't feel like the city has done much for them. And if you look at even the city Cesar Chavez event, it's a very milk toast, very uh, watered down event that certainly doesn't inspire or excite me or um, is informative or educational. I mean, the, the folklorico dancers are great, but like, it's very routine. And, you know, what Victor suggested and what we ultimately did is we brought together a group of Latinos who live in Glendale, who are stakeholders and said, what is an event that you would want to have? What do you want to see done in the city? I know it's grandma and grandpa calling, I'll call them back. Um, so um, ultimately what we decided to do, what we want to do was like a voter education drive and voter registration drive. Unfortunately, this was happening right after um, uh, President Trump had been elected. And what we decided to do, and I'll, I'll say why it was unfortunate in just a second, but we decided to have like a um, Zocalo, like a town square event with food and music and also interspersed city services and explanations in Spanish as to what services are available. And we were gonna do it at the Pacific Edison Park uh, in South Glendale in the plaza, where they also have the Cesar Chavez event. Well, we soon realized that at that time when there was all these issues with immigration crackdowns and ICE, that it probably is not great to have this event that tries to attract the Latino community and then go around and ask people, hey, are you a registered voter? Are you a US citizen? Um, it would not be the right approach. So we decided to pull back on the voter registration part of it, but still do the event and have it focus around Dia de los Muertos, um, have it be cultural information and education, um, and still have some information available, but mostly to try and get families to come out and we can also identify who are people that we could um, tap to volunteer for future events and, and things that we organized. Well, we expected only like 100 people. We ended up having 350, 400 people come out to that. And it was when the Dodgers were in the World Series. It was a tremendous success. <laughs> That's and great. it was all organized by community members. Yeah. And so and these events have to be for the community, by the community. And Absolutely. that's one of the things I think that we need to get towards, is not having the city plan these events, but have the LGBT community plan what they feel is best for them and represents and highlights their community what uh, highlights and is best for the Armenian community or whatever. And then ultimately maybe we can do one large event that brings everyone together, but that large event that brings everyone together should just be living in Glendale. It should be our everyday life. Um, it shouldn't have to be one special day. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you um, just, I wanna go back to the, um, and, and this will be, I, I think we have like two more questions around this idea of a human relations um, commission. Cause I know many cities have a, um, a human relations committee and Glendale does not have one. Um, what is it gonna take to not only establish that commission, but also that it be taken as a serious commission and that those voices that are need to be appointed to the commission are there? I mean, what do you think it's gonna take to actually make something like this happen? Because I do agree, I think, you know, having cultural events and all those things are really great for ra raising awareness about other cultures, but if the city doesn't, take ownership and responsibility um, for their part in promoting diversity and inclusion, um, you know, then those, those, those events kind of fall on deaf's ears, right? And so I think this, having the city backing and supporting that gives it more credibility in the community, it gives us more visibility. So um, tell me what do you think as us listening out here, if, if we want to um, support something like this and we want to see something like this happen, what is it going to take to happen and, and how can we make sure that if it does happen, that it is inclusive of those different groups? Well, first of all, I think that um, there's two approaches. One is we could go about this on our own or the other is we could look at some city that we want to emulate. I know Burbank has one. I don't know how effective it's been in Burbank, but to look at some model that we could follow and possibly um, uh, implement and build on here in Glendale. Uh, in terms of what practically can be done, a council member has to raise the issue and I'm planning on doing it. It's just that we eventually, you know, we, we got stuck into this crisis and we're dealing with those issues right now. But um, coming out of it or just before, I'm, I'm going to ask for a, the establishment of uh, a couple of new commissions. One is an ethics commission. The other is going to be um, uh, an environmental sustainability commission. And I definitely know I have support on that. And the last one is going to be a human relations commission, but I also want a charter review commission 
which is more internal and more nuanced about you know how our city is structured and some of those changes. So that's what we can do. But then after that, we have to figure out it's not just great to have a commission and have you know these issues die by committee. We have to have some ex some explicit goals, and one of those is to figure out what is it that we're trying to change. Um, you know, just like when we look at the federal government and you know the 14th Amendment um, helped. Uh, bring about a lot of changes and institute equality um, was intended to institute equality for African Americans after the Civil War. But the reason the Civil Rights Act had to pass in 1964 is because that only applied to government entities and not to the private sector. There was still private sector institutionalized racism and uh, affirmative action tried to address that. So when we look at this commission, there'll have to be a couple of things, right? One is the city looking at itself internally as an organization as to what it's doing to be more reflective of the community, to create more opportunities, to create more understanding. And I'm not just talking about the traditional um, attorney-led um, uh, seminars that you go to and you get certificates saying, well, I attended the seminar, I now know how to be more culturally or racially sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at, you know, how what is it that we want to see? Do we want to see um, people of color, women, and others in leadership positions or be poised for positions of leadership? Do we want to be that incubator where people come here, get experiences, and then go out and change the world and do great things? And then secondly, you know, working with the schools, hopefully getting representatives from the schools on a commission like that, from the college, um, and making sure that we're having a communication to find out what they're doing. Sometimes they're doing things at a far more advanced uh, rate than we are. I mean, the school district now has had a pride event for a number of years, whereas the city is now just trying to figure out what its own one will look like. Um, and lastly, you know, community wise, what are events in the community? Again, I don't want to get into the position where government is imposing or forcing community, the community to do the things that uh, it thinks it should do. The community has to ultimately, you know, we need to have a bottom up approach to governance. And, and we've seen success of such movements with the Glendale Environmental Coalition um, and, and others. You know, we have the um, Armenian National Committee, which has for years been advocating on behalf of um, Armenian Americans' rights and interests. We have Blacking Glendale, which has been revived recently um, and it is, is doing some advocacy work in that regard. We need to do that and continue to do that and work with everyone. And by the way, I, I do want to en encourage people to read John Cho, uh, who's a famous actor. He's the Harold from the, of Harold and Kumar fame, uh, Asian American actor, uh, American actor of Asian ancestry. He wrote an article about how American citizenship or being American is conditional because of all these negative things and um, the, the racist connotations around referring to the coronavirus as a Chinese virus and how Asians are being treated. There was an Asian family that was attacked and stabbed in Texas. And, and I just want to mention that John Cho is a Glendale, a, a, a favorite son of Glendale. He's a graduate of Hoover High School. Um, so, you know, bringing in all the communities together and figuring out what the city can do to help them succeed. And one last thing I want to say, Tara, you know, yeah. The, the reflection room, the, the room um, in the library, the reflective space, is one of the most wonderful spaces. And that room, by the way, was an idea that came out of the committee that I saw, sat on. It was actually one of the things I had suggested um, from the controversy of the flag lowering. There were three things that were supposed to come of that. One was a room in the library that was going to be a dedicated education center. Um, the other was an annual week of commemorative events that talked about all events and the capstone event would be about the Armenian genocide. And the last one was to have some place in the city of Glendale that was going to be designated for a spot for a memorial um, for the Armenian genocide, which at the time the compromise was the Armenian community was going to pay for it and the city would give the land. Um, and then that got kicked around and has now transformed and manifested itself as what we hope one day will be the American Armenian Museum. Right. So you, let's have it. we've made progress. We, yeah. we are better, but we have work to do. Absolutely, absolutely. And it and I know it can seem overwhelming as so many issues, but I, I do know that um, we can all together make a difference. And so I think part of this dialogue is a first step in making it uh, um, making a difference. And I thank everyone for being here. Thank you, Artie, for your insight and your and your time and your commitment to this community. 
Uh, YWC at Glendale looks forward to partnering with you um, and the City Council on anything related to, of course, women and, um, and, and inclusion and diversity. And so, again, just thank you so much for being a champion and, pe and being a voice. And, um, um, and with that, um, we'll just say goodbye to everyone. Thank you. I did notice that there's some questions. Yes, I, I think don't know how I, I the best we, way to answer those. Could yeah, should I, I stay on? I think I answered. Answer? I think I answered them all. I think the only question that's maybe pending is whether or not um, the um, city council um, or si the city collects any information around racial discrimination that's occurring. So here's the thing that they. they I don't know if they do and I don't think they do and I have some problems with the fact that I don't even know clearly how hate crimes are calculated and I know this because I when my campaign was threatened because I'm Armenian and they said we're going to come down there I'll come down there and I'll kill every single one of you we reported that and we wanted it to be reported as a hate crime and it, you know when I asked to see the records of it from our and I know who I spoke to because I was the city clerk at the time so um, and when I went to go try and get those records afterwards, um, there was no record of my complaint or the incident, even though there were multiple witnesses to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I have some issues and I do want to look into how that, I mean, that's not the only one. I can go down the list of a number of things I've reported, not just related to Armenians, but others that um, I don't know how they got calculated. So I am going to ask questions um, of our police department um, as to how they, they calculate that and why certain things have not been calculated. Awesome, awesome. Well, I think right. that's it, Artie. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for participating, and we will be in touch soon, everyone. Take care and be well. If anyone wants to email me, you can email me at my city address, and I'll try to answer your questions. Be safe, stay strong. We'll talk soon. Thank you.